Thank you. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Let me get a little more light on it. A little more light. All right. Um, we're on page 94 talking about diatomes. You ever heard of diatomes before? They, they're little creatures that float around in the ocean, microscopic. We're going to look at them. They're everywhere. They're photosynthetic. You know what that means? They get their food from sunlight. Very nice. Yeah, they float around and do photosynthesis. So you find most of these on, on the surface of the ocean, not down deep. They have yellow and brown pigments, not green. So they're kind of brown looking. We're going to catch a bunch of these in our plankton nets when we drag our nets out there. That'll be fun. And you can see them under our scopes. <coughs> the shell is made of silica. Silica is basically glass. Did y'all know glass comes from sand that gets real hot? So these creatures can take sand, basically, and rearrange it, not using heat, but using their metabolism to make a shell that's like a glass shell. It's pretty cool, and it protects them. So there are little tiny glass shells surrounding these diatoms. They're the most important primary producer on Earth. Oh, by the way, the shell is called a frustule. That's kind of a cool word. That's a new word, a frustule. By the way, are you still dating your entries? Does everybody do that each time? Make sure you do that on the count. So I say they're the most important primary producer on Earth. Diatoms make more oxygen than trees do. I mean, there are these are all over all the oceans, and there's way more ocean on the Earth than there is land. So there's more diatom out there than there are trees. Mostly solitary, but some can form colonies. And as they make their food, they store it as an oil, which is light. And so it aids them in buoyancy. The oil allows them to float. Their body's full of oil. Do they only live in the water? Yes, they're only found in the ocean. They're most, well, some are found in freshwater, but mostly they're marine. Salt water. Here's a, here's a look at one. It looks like a little hat box. Have you ever seen a hat box? Back in the old days, they put hats in boxes that are shaped like that. With the top, with one half larger than the other half, so it kind of fits over it. And here inside the box, the shell, the box is the shell, the frustule is the shell. Inside, this is the cell. It's got a nucleus, it's got chloroplasts there that do photosynthesis, but they aren't green, they're brown or gold. It's got mitochondria, and there's the oil droplets that help it float. Now, not all of them are shaped like that. Some of them are triangular. Some of them are long. The ones that we find around here when we drag our plankton nets are round. But you can see they're kind of glassy. They're sometimes called the jewels of the sea. Ah. <laughs> Spoonful of ocean would have maybe hundreds of these. There's another cool picture. What will happen is when these things die, their little shells will float down to the bottom of the ocean and become part of the bottom of the ocean. 
And then, every once in a while, there's some, some movements of the plates that will actually push one of the oceanic plates up above the water. And, and then it'll dry out and, and form rock. And you can dig up, dig out, and sort through the rock and find these little shells in the rock. They're like fossils. And they call this kind of rock that contains lots of diatom shells, diatomaceous earth. And the diatomaceous earth is really valuable because if you, if you sort through it and dig out all these little uh, fossil diatoms, you can put them in products. And they don't do it by hand. They have machines that can you know, crush it up and spin it around and separate it by weight so that you can just get these little shells. Have you ever noticed your toothpaste has a little grit to it? You know, kind of if you chew on your toothpaste, you'll feel a little bit of grit. Those are diatom shells. They put diatom shells in almost all toothpaste. And that'll scrape your teeth a little bit. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's the grit you feel in, in, in toothpaste. Maybe we should all go brush our teeth to see if we can feel it. I have a toothbrush here we can all share. It's <laughs> gross. The diatoms, they, they have a weird way they reproduce that I want to show you. The book talks about. The cell divides. And each, that should say, resulting cell gets one half of the frustule. The cell now must secrete the other half of the frustule, the smaller piece. Due to this, diatoms get smaller each time they reproduce, which I'll show you in the picture. To restore normal size, they must either sexually reproduce or cast off the frustule and secrete an entire new frustule. They show this funky method of reproduction on the top of page 95. And I'll explain it once you'll get done writing this. They also have a real good picture of a dino of a oh no, that's not a diatom, that's a dino fly. So never mind. Yes, diatoms sexually reproduce. Diatom sex. It's very boring. <laughs> Trey, you getting all that? Yeah, I guess. Can I turn? Are we getting close? This is on the top of page 95. Here's the original diatom. Like I say, it's like a hat box. It's got a top part and a bottom part. And then it'll separate. It'll break in two. And the, the half 
can only secrete a smaller portion. It can't secrete a, a larger shell. So this big top half secretes a bottom half that's smaller. But this smaller bottom half secretes a top half that's even smaller. And so you can see if the process continues, it's going to get smaller and smaller over time. This one right here, this, this top half here is small and it has to secrete a smaller. So if this continues, eventually these diatoms will be so small that they can't reproduce anymore. So then what they'll do is they'll release a, what's called a spore, an oxospore. And it's basically what they're doing there is they're casting off both shells. And the new, and this oxospore will grow two new real big shells and start back over. Or, when they get real small, they'll start squirting out sperms and eggs. <laughs> and only the small, only the real small ones do this. So only the small sexually reproduce. And the sperms and eggs will meet each other in the water and grow into a larger organism that secretes big shells. And the whole thing starts over. So that's the sexual reproduction. So it's kind of funny, the big ones never sexually reproduce, only the small ones. So if you're a diatom and you want to have sex, you got to be small. <laughs> it's not sex like we have, though. They're just squirting sperm and eggs into the water. They don't. They don't, like, get on top of one another. <laughs> Okay, enough about diatom sex. Um, what about dinoflagellates? Dinoflagellates. It's a cool name. They're mostly photosynthetic. Some of them can eat. You can just write eat instead of ingest particles. That's the scientific word for eating. Each species has a unique shape reinforced by plates of cellulose. They have these tough cellulose plates that protect them. They usually have two flagella. Two flagella in grooves on the body that produce motion. The way these things move is very interesting. They, uh, they spin around as they move, which I'll show you in just a second. Two flagella in grooves on body that produce motion. Some are bioluminescent. Do you know what that means? They glow in the dark. And these little glowing creatures, they'll light up the water. <coughs> There's an extra reading section called Bay of Fire on page 96 that you should take a look at. It talks about this bay in Puerto Rico that glows. I'll let you read about it tonight. I actually have some bioluminescent algae that I ordered that we're going to look at under the microscope and you can see them glowing. So we'll talk more about bioluminescence later. It's a pretty cool property. Let me show you how these things move around. You can see what they look like here. This, this protecting cover is made of cellulose. Cellulose is the same tough material that protects a plant, like a tree. Your paper is made of cellulose. Did you know that? Because your paper comes from trees. And the cell walls of the tree, of the plant cells, are tough cellulose. So it's like they have a cardboard or a paper, tough paper covering. 
you can see there's a flagella. There's two flagellas. There's a flagella that hangs back here that moves it forward, and there's a flagella twisted around this way that causes it to spin. So these things are spinning like crazy through the water. Now you have to think, why would you, why would you want to spin while you're moving? Any idea? Something about food? That's a good guess, but not really. It has to do, any hunters out there, anyone here ever shoot a gun? To avoid predators. What's that? It cuts through the water. H have you ever heard, did, did you know a rifle has, the reason why they call it a rifle is because there's a groove in the, um, in the gun, in the, in the uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? In the barrel. That, uh, that causes the bullet to spin as it comes out. And they figured this out a long time ago. If you rifle the barrel, if you make a groove in it and get that bullet spinning, it goes a lot further and straighter than if, it, than if it's not spinning. If it comes out not spinning, it'll be like a knuckleball in baseball. It won't go straight. But if you spin the thing, it can go straight. And so they have this, this flagellum that makes it spin and this flagellum that moves it forward and it, it, it allows it to move faster and straighter through the water. Dinoflagellates can often go through what we call a uh, population explosion. And here we see one. This red color you see are just trillions of dinoflagellates. And they'll go through this population explosion if there's too much uh, too much detergent or fertilizer gets in the water. It's usually due to pollution. If you have um, farms that use a lot of fertilizer and then it rains after they put down the fertilizer, the fertilizer will run off in the water and the water will go to a, you know, the river takes the fertilizer into a, a lake or something like that. And then the, the dinoflagellates will use that fertilizer and will multiply like crazy. It's called an algae bloom. And often these dinoflagellates carry a, a, a poison inside of them or excrete some sort of toxin. And so we call this a red tide. You ever heard of a red tide? Yes. In the reading last night, it said that cyanobacteria cause red tides. Um, they can too, but dinoflagellates do it as well. Now, dinoflagellates may have cyanobacteria inside them. That could be. I don't know. I'll have to check on that. But dinoflagellates will definitely do it. And, uh... So, did you say they secrete poison? Yes. They, so, if you got into that water right there, you'd be pretty much screwed? Yes, and as a matter of fact, if there's a big red tide, they'll close the beach. And uh, they, that's hap that happened down in Jacksonville a few years ago. They had a red tide just floating out there, and they closed the whole beach. If you swim in that, you can and ingest the water, drink the water, it can, it can kill you. People have died from red tides. Doesn't it kill all the animals, too? Yes. It can kill all the fish swimming around in it. So it can get very dangerous. Now, there's a type of dinoflagellate called a zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae is how you pronounce that word. Everybody say zooxanthellae on three. One, two, three. Zooxanthellae. Pretty good. Zooxanthellae, important dinoflagellates that live in a symbiotic relationship with corals, sea anemone, and other organisms. We're going to learn about corals later. This is a coral, this picture down here. You've heard of a coral reef? They build giant reefs out of their shells. And the coral, all this red stuff you see here, are little dinoflagellates that live with the coral and do photosynthesis. It's a relationship they have. A symbiotic relationship. That means they're living together. <clears throat> now, 
And the coral can't really survive without them. Because these zoanthellae, they do photosynthesis and make food during the daytime. And the coral help absorb the food. And then at nighttime, the coral go out and hunt. So the coral are getting food at night by hunting, and they're getting food in the day by absorbing um, nutrients from their dinoflagellates. So we call that a mutualism. You ever heard that word, mutualism? A relationship there. They found that if you, they've done experiments, if you kill the zoanthellae, the coral won't get enough food to survive. So they really depend on one another. Of course, if the coral aren't there, the zoanthellae aren't there because they have nowhere to live. We uh, will study coral in detail later. I've got a lot of coral in the lab to, that I can show you. Pretty cool. Dead coral, not living coral. The coral secretes shells that are real tough. A few dinoflagellates lack chloroplasts and live as parasites. Some species can reproduce and produce red tides. That's what I was talking about. There's a reading about red tides on page 338 you might want to look at. We are going to get there this, this year. So if you're really into red tides, you can write down 338, because we won't get to that chapter. They show a, a red tide in Mexico on, in the picture on 338. Theosteria is a dinoflagellate that produces serious toxins that can cause massive fish kills, harm shellfish, impair the nervous system. Discovered near the Outer Banks in North Carolina. I don't think any of this is in our reading here, so it's just a little extra information. So I wouldn't worry about writing this stuff down. Oh, no, it is, it is in our reading. Never mind. Sorry. It is there on the bottom of 96. It talks about hysteria. So it's only certain dinoflagellates that cause red tides. Not all of them will cause red tides. <coughs> Y'all know where the Outer Banks is, North Carolina? Yes. It's like a series of islands, kind of like St. Simon's Island, that run out on North Carolina and the coast there. Is that where, like, Atlantic City is? No, Atlantic City is north of that. That's in New Jersey. Really? Yeah. I thought it was in North Carolina. Maybe the southern part of Atlantic City hits the northern part of the Outer Banks. Because I have a that friend who has a house in Atlantic City, and I thought it was in North Carolina. No, it's New Jersey. Oh. They got a lot of gambling goes on up there. You gotta be careful. Running around Atlantic City. Gonna move on here. You can just read about, just write, read about Fisteria, page 96. There's the big bay of fire that they talk about in the extra reading section. At night, you can see. If a boat's running through here, you can see there's so many of these bioluminescent algae or dino, uh, dinoflagellates that it glows. There's a cool story about a, uh, a fighter pilot. Uh, he got hit in one of the wars. I don't know what, when it was Vietnam or something. He had gotten hit and knocked out his radio. And he couldn't find the, uh, the aircraft carrier. 
And so he's just flying around kind of blind out there, just looking for this aircraft carrier. His radio's out. He doesn't have anywhere to land. And he's about to ditch his plane in the ocean, just eject and, and probably die. He's just floating around out there in the ocean with no radio. And, uh, and he just kind of didn't know what to do, so he turned out all the lights in the cockpit. Whoops, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, that's Doug. Hold on. Hello? <laughs> hey, Doug, what's up? Uh-huh. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it during break, and I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Bye. Maybe we'll call the golf match. Um, sorry. He's driving the golf team now. And communicate with him. Um. So. So the pilot didn't know what to do, so he turns off all the lights in the cockpit, and he sees on the horizon this glowing line. And then so he flies over to it, and it's the it's the uh, dieto or the dinoflagellates that have been churned up by the propeller on the aircraft carrier are glowing because when you when you when you bother them they'll glow, <coughs> and that led him right that line that long line led him right to the boat. Isn't that cool? Are dinoflagellates the only things like that that? No, glow? there's a lot of different things that glow. There's some algae in the ocean that glow too. And jellyfish can glow. I was on Sea Island one time at night on this dock, and it was glowing, and we like jumped in the water and swam. And you could see it glowing around here. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. There's a lot of things in the ocean that glow. Bioluminescence is pretty big. A lot of ocean organisms will communicate that way. And you know, once you go under 300 feet deep, it's completely dark. No light penetrates that much. So if you want to see anything down there, you have to glow. Make your own light. And so organisms will communicate and find one another to, to mate and such by glowing. There's a red tide, and there's a boat out there sampling the red tide. You can see he's dragging some kind of thing through it. See that long line there? This red tide will just sit there for days. It's not like it's moving. It looks like it's chasing him, but it's not. It just kind of floats around. And eventually, the tides will wash it in and out, and they'll disperse or die, because there's, uh, there's so many of them next to one another, they can crowd each other out and start to die. There's a couple other species called silicoflagellates and coccolithophores. Silicoflagellates have little star-shaped silica shells. And coccolithophores kind of look like this. They got these little round um, calcium carbonate plates that kind of sit on top of one another. Very pretty. More microscopic organisms that you might see when we look at all this ocean water. Of course, this is with an electron microscope, so we wouldn't be able to see nearly this close. That should say uh, photosynthetic, not phytosynthetic. You know what the word plankton means? No? Have you ever seen uh, SpongeBob plankton on SpongeBob? Plankton is any organism that floats around in the ocean. And it's usually microscopic. Some of them are photosynthetic, make their own food, some of them don't. Moving on, you got to write fast in this class. Okay, foraminiferans, also called forams. They have these calcium carbonate shells. And 
pseudopods, which are known as false feet. Pseudopods are part of the cell that sticks out and will go through holes in the shell and capture organisms. Calcium carbonate is, is a tough, hard material. It's the same thing that shells that you find on the beach are made of, calcium carbonate. Don't like clams and stuff have pseudopods? Yeah, uh, no, they don't call those pseudopods. Those are actually, they actually call that the foot. And it does stick a foot out and dig with that foot. But a pseudopod is, a, is part of a, a, a cell that can extend and retract back to the, the globular form of the cell. It's like what amoebas have. Amoebas have these pseudopods. So this is a little foraminiferin. It's pretty. They put the light here behind it. All these little things you see here are its pseudopods, little false feet. And it sticks them out through the little holes in its shell. Those are little holes in the shell. And what it'll do, these things, these little things here can grab the food particle and pull it in back into the shell. And there's a cell inside the shell that will eat the food. So anything that happens, any bacteria or something that's floating in the water will be captured and pulled in. And these things just float around, these foraminiferins. Here we see some red ones with little holes. You don't see anything sticking out of these holes right now. But they can. They can stick uh, little pieces of their uh, body out through the little holes. So they're not microscopic? They are microscopic. Huh. These are microscopic. Now maybe these are bigger, but I think that's still microscopic. Let's see what it says. Foraminiferin that forms bright red calcareous growth several millimeters in diameter. Yeah, that one's uh, not microscopic on the right. The one on the left is microscopic. So those are pretty big foraminiferins. I just like to say foraminiferin. The one on the right is so common in Bermuda that its skeletons are responsible for the island's famous pink beaches. See, when these things die, those become dislodged and become part of the sand. You probably were looking at some of them when you looked at a, a sand under the microscope and saw little things with tiny holes in it that were reddish or pinkish. Did you see any of that? Coral can be that too. It doesn't have to be this. There's red coral that can break apart and look, look the same way. Have you ever heard of the white cliffs of Dover? This is a huge cliff in England. And you can see how big it is. These are people down here hiking to it. And the reason why it's white is because it has huge amounts of these foraminiferin shells. And when the foraminiferins die, their little bodies float to the bottom of the ocean. And then here in England, the bottom of the ocean got pushed up real high and then eroded. The wall of this eroded from waves hitting it. And so you can see all the white there are just trillions of bodies of shells of dead foraminiferins. And the shells are white, so it makes the cliff look white. Of course, pushing up a big cliff takes millions of years, but that's okay. The earth is billions of years old. So all the white you see in the cliff here is from foraminiferin shells. There's another organism called a radiolarian. It looks just like a foraminiferin, but it has a silica shell instead of a calcium carbonate shell. Remember, silica is like glass. They also have pseudopods. They stick them through the shell 
and capture food just like the foraminiferans.
There's another picture of a ciliate. All the little hairs around it. And then finally, fungi. That's the last thing. There's fungus floating all around the ocean. You've heard of fungus before, right? If you've ever eaten mushrooms, you've eaten a fungus. Fungus are decomposers. They break down dead organic matter into detritus. So when something dies, a fungus will grow on it. Bacteria do the same thing. Heterotrophic means they eat other things, they break down other compounds. Most of them are microscopic. Here's the body of a fungus. It kind of looks like a like a long strand, and the fungus will grow these strands on things. If you've ever seen a dead fish in an aquarium with a bunch of white stuff on them, that's fungus. This line you see here is a bunch of fungi living in association with, with algae called, called lichens.